Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga. And today it's time for some long-awaited My Hero Academia talk, which comes about because I finally got the chance to see Heroes Rising, and what's going to follow is a spoiler-filled review and general discussion. But firstly, just some context so that you know where I'm coming at this from. I have a very, let's say, on and off relationship with My Hero Academia, where I do truly love the series and it never fails to entertain me, as well as hit some very core emotional resonance, but for whatever reason, I always struggle to retain my interest in it during the long term, and I usually pick it up again coinciding with each anime season. So I am up to date with the anime as it stands at the time of this recording, and in terms of the manga, if I recall correctly, I'm actually a bit beyond that. Although I am planning on catching up imminently, and then perhaps making some My Hero Academia videos for this channel if people are interested. And you know, if you are, please do let me know in the comments. And actually, you know what, we can probably call this a bit of a test video to determine the appetite for My Hero Academia stuff, so don't forget to like this video either if that's a thing you want. But as for the film, I was lucky enough to see this in a cinema, which is an experience that I would highly recommend, or actually probably not so much in our current climate, stay at home and be safe everyone. However, seeing this on a big screen was quite the treat, especially in regards to the final fight, which was just, oh wow, well, and we'll get to that for sure. To start with though, I thought that this feature had a very clever premise in regards to isolating class 1A from the rest of society, because My Hero Academia can run into some big problems in regards to finding excuses for our students to face off against villains, because it almost always makes more sense to call for help from a pro hero, so that whole idea was handled wonderfully here. The class are cut off from greater society, and they are then forced to act in a most dire situation. It's also a wonderfully simple premise, which I think is very necessary for a film that is just over 100 minutes long. You really don't want to get too complicated here, especially with the absurd quantity of characters that you need to deal with. And speaking of, I feel like I always underestimate the size of class 1A in my head, because really it's such a massive amount of characters, and to the credit of Heroes Rising, each and every one of them gets a pretty decent amount of focus and screen time to do their own thing. Classic film study would teach us that a story like this simply should not be possible due to needing to function with, you know, 20 protagonists, as well as not just one, but two groups of villains and an entire town to develop as well. So I think that characters were handled, yeah, about as well as they could be. Like no matter who your favorite member of class 1A is, I think you would be very satisfied with their involvement in the film. And there are even a few really fun highlights. The one that surprised me the most being Aoyama. So where I am currently, Aoyama hasn't done a whole lot. So it was really nice to see him shine in this film with such a devastating naval laser blast and just generally being pushed to a limit that I've not seen him reach. So good on him. He felt well and truly involved as a member of the class, which is exactly what I want from him. We were also given a very standard amount of Todoroki, which I always appreciate because I find his powers to be some of the craziest crap that this series has to offer. And along the same lines, there was also some very nice time with Tokoyami, who has always been one of my personal favorite members of class 1A. And anytime we get to see Dark Shadow go berserk, well, count me in. With all of this said, the heart of the film as expected from the trailer and I guess the series in general, comes from the characters of Izuku and Bakugo and their volatile yet increasingly cordial dynamic. This partnership is one for the ages though, and this film gave me exactly what I was looking for, and you know, even a little bit more in that regard. And I guess I should probably get this out of the way now, but my god, that final fight is quite possibly one of the most beautiful scenes that I have ever seen put on screen. Although I will question the decision to all of a sudden have Izuku and Bakugo assume the roles of Saiyan warriors with the heavily Dragon Ball evocative hair, but I think that's the only thing that struck me as a little bit off. Everything else was pretty much pure perfection, especially the choice of music. It was this soft, emotional track with female vocals that if you had heard out of context, you would likely never imagine that it would synergize so well with a spectacle action piece, where you've got apocalyptic weather, explosions, mass destruction, and just a cyclone of action going on everywhere, but it works brilliantly. And I believe it was actually used in the series as well during the overhaul battle, where it worked pretty damn incredibly as well. But in my opinion, the film definitely has superior use of this song. It actually gives me some Demon Slayer episode 19 kind of vibes, which implemented a similar strategy to equal, if not greater effect. And I think that anime companies have stumbled upon a bit of a gold mine here, where they've realized that soft music only goes to highlight the action further through its juxtaposition, rather than having some sort of super energy track competing with the visuals on screen. And I will also say that I love the decision to remove the sound entirely for a huge chunk of the final clash and just have that brilliant track playing, which I did look up actually, and it's called Might Plus You by composer Yuki Hayashi. So phenomenal work there by the composer and equally as stunning work was put in by the director and the animation team. This clash is really just one of those moments that is going to stay with me for an awfully long time. And this film was worth it just to see that. I also really enjoyed the idea that Izuku was forced into a situation where he had to face the reality of giving up his dream of being a hero. And when you think about it, it's all for such a simple reason as well. Izuku was willing to part with everything that he had worked for just to save the quirk of one, count him, one young boy. And I mean, yeah, there was obviously a greater threat at hand in Nine, who would become an exceptional threat with said quirk, but still, it's classic Deku, and I love him for it. And seeing him doing that, in fact, not only that, but seeing Bakugo actually accept the quirk, for the sake of both of them invoking one for 
all to secure their victory was incredibly powerful stuff. It reminds me of one of the Dragon Ball movies, Fusion Reborn, you know, the one with Janemba, where Goku and Vegeta have this moment of understanding and decide to fuse together. This moment in Heroes Rising obviously surpassed that in every way, shape and form, and it had a lot more meaning attached to it because this was Izuku relinquishing everything, which while I did feel that pretty hard, there was an undeniable voice in the back of my head saying, well, this is, um, hmm, this is going to need to be fixed, and Izuku is going to need to end up with one fall again. And in my mind, the likely scenario was going to be that Bakugo would just pass the quirk back to Izuku with this salty, you know, like, damn Deku, I didn't want your stupid quirk anyway. I want to beat you on my own terms, Ra rah, 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 rah. And in fact, come to think of it, I don't actually know if one for all can be passed back to a previous user. If that's been answered anywhere and I've either forgotten about it or just haven't reached it yet, then please do let me know, because I'm genuinely interested now. I guess part of me wants to believe that once you've passed it on, you can't reclaim it. Otherwise, what's to stop like rampant quirk passing? I mean, why not just pass it to five people in quick succession and then fight with five one for alls? In any case, I'm getting way off topic here. What I was trying to get to is that my least favorite part of the film, where after the brilliantly done high stakes emotional matchup, we're left in this place where everything needs to be put back to the status quo. And I really hated the explanation of how that happened. You know, the whole Izuku still has his quirk because miracle predecessors and stuff. And I'm not saying that it doesn't make sense. It does because my hero academia pulls that kind of crap in the actual series as well. But it just feels like such a lazy way of restoring the status quo, like a true deus ex machina that pops up out of nowhere and makes sure that everything is okay. I think it could have been done infinitely better, like my suggestion about Bakugo just giving it back in his own dignified way. And if there is a problem in that you can't have film continuity Bakugo remember that he used one for all, then just have it erase his memory after he gives the quirk back. If he can give it back, I'm actually assuming a lot here. In any case, my point is that it was a clumsy ending to an otherwise superbly structured conflict. And just while we're on things I didn't like because I can be a hypercritical prick, let's talk about the villains, specifically our head honcho, Nine. I really don't care for this character at all. And I think that he was probably the weakest part of the film, which is a big problem because he's very much the one who instigates all of the major action. And if I had to sum up why I didn't really care for him, I'd say it was because he was a mostly apathetic blank slate with a quirk gimmick that we've already explored a multitude of times already in the series being quirk theft and holding multiple quirks. And to top it all off, his design was, it wasn't bad, but it was standard at best. It was nothing special. So there was nothing really to, you know, latch onto. Oh, and to add on to that, he has the archetypal bad guy motivation, which I refer to as the utopia goal. You know, bad guy who wants to change the world and reshape it in his own image. And some villains do this better than others. Not this one though, because Nine's reason for doing so was just because power and stuff. And it's just really boring. There's actually nothing that I find interesting about Nine. Not even the quirks he uses because none of them get used in a particularly creative way. I mean, oh, he fires lasers and puts up barriers and dragons. And I just don't understand how all of that can be made so boring, but hey, he accomplished it. And in general, he lacks a lot of the subtlety and thorough exploration that actually my Hero Academia villains have, which is such a key aspect of making the series interesting. A series like My Hero Academia lives and dies on its villains because heroes alone are not enough. And for the most part, My Hero Academia does a great job with figures like Stain, Shigaraki, and in fact, pretty much the entire League of Villains and even guys like Gentle Criminal. Nine, on the other hand, is a reject. He is a villain who serves a technical purpose and his motivation isn't explored anywhere near enough to remember that this guy even existed the moment after I pushed the publish button for this video. His lackeys weren't too bad though, especially Chimera, who probably got the most development out of all of them and was the only one that I ended up feeling anything for by the end of the film. And you know, a lot of this might just be the general limits of making an anime film. There's no time to really craft a product that can in any way stand up to the actual series, but that doesn't mean that it is impossible. I feel like Heroes Rising probably could have spent a bit less time portraying action and just given a few much needed minutes to Nine because he is helming the story. And it would have made the final conflict all that more epic if we'd actually had a stake in this character as well. Still, as much as I've ranted there, this is a minor issue to me. It's an anime film. I didn't go into it expecting the villains to have incredible depth. And in the end, I do have to admit that Nine served his purpose. He provided a threat that required Class 1A to come together and use everything they'd learned thus far to overcome him. And that rather simply is the appeal of Heroes Rising. We are here to see our protagonists kick some ass and continue their journeys to become professional heroes. And that's exactly what the film delivers. So as much as there were aspects that I wish could have been better, to say that I didn't get exactly what I wanted out of this film would be an outright lie. It was an incredibly fun experience as My Hero Academia tends to be and highly recommend it if you're a fan of the series. Although I would say don't expect anything, you know, groundbreaking. You're just going to be served more of what you already love with a side dish of Bakugo being infused with one for all. And you know what? 
That actually sounds like a pretty damn fine value proposition to me. But what did you guys think of the film? Please do feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below, or even come and join the fun on my Discord server. And if you're keen for some more anime content, then feel free to check out my other videos and even subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more of that My Hero Academia fantasticness. But for now, this has been the New World Review, and I'll see you next time.